So what's good, TMG fam? It's your boy L, and I'm back with another reaction. How y'all feel? Welcome back to the channel. Salute. So it's time for some mysterious cases, crazy cases, eerie cases. This is five eerie, unsolved cases that recently had breakthroughs. All right, so you know how we get down. Shh. Let me tell y'all, because you know I'm about to remind y'all, lock your windows, lock your doors, make sure the place is secure. I just had to do the same thing, and of course, my front door was unlocked. I had to go up there and talk to my sons again. Boy, raising boys, bro, it's like running my head to a brick wall constantly. You know what I'm saying? Constantly. I was like, yo, I just told y'all a story about a dude who was going through people's houses when the door was unlocked. He was using it as like an invitation, right? I just told y'all that story. Come upstairs, door is unlocked. One ear, out the other. <laughs> I love him to death, bro. So after that, man, after y'all make sure y'all secure and anything like that, man. If you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button, join the fam. Moment of silence for the haters. That's enough. Now, run the likes up. Make sure y'all hit that like button. Let's go. The term cold case refers to an investigation that either lacked evidence or came to a dead end and was put away for a long period of time. Some cold cases date back to the early 1900s, and thankfully, with technology advancing every day and former witnesses finally coming forward after years of silence, some cold cases are lucky enough to be solved. Whether it's just after five years or several decades, a breakthrough in a cold case can provide long-awaited answers to family members of victims and a new direction for investigators interested in the case. Number 5 In 1993, a 19-year-old man named Frank McAllister was reported missing. His then-girlfriend had not heard from Frank in several days, and after checking his home and workplace, decided the situation was serious enough for the police to get involved. A search for the young man lasted several months before investigators ended the search due to a lack of evidence or any new leads. The following year, Frank's remains were discovered by a hiker in Shingletown, California. The investigation sparked again as officers searched for a killer. Unfortunately, they reached yet another dead end and were forced to label the case as cold, meaning the ongoing investigation would stop indefinitely. Despite locating the remains of the missing man, the case eventually went cold and untouched for decades. However, in January of 2018, 25 years after the murder, 44-year-old Brian Keith Hawkins called a local TV news station in his area to confess to the crime. He stated that he could no longer deal with the guilt he felt over his involvement in the crime. The station's producers immediately took the confession very seriously and briefly interviewed Hawkins. He made a statement with the station which was shared with the Reading police. A few days later, Hawkins agreed to meet with officers to turn himself in and provided more information about the case. Hawkins led the officers to two other suspects that were allegedly involved in the murder. Reading police arrested all three just a few days after the initial confession, and a trial was set to begin soon after, in which evidence would be re-examined with new information. The mother two karma, baby, thought she was going to get away with it. Huh? You thought she was going to get see, see, the thing is, man, it's, it's going to come get you. Crime like that, unusual crime like that, bro, for you to do that. Hold on, y'all. I don't know why this thing is on. I thought I had silenced it. But yeah, somebody in the group is going to fold. You see it all the time in like drug cases and stuff like that. Group of homeboys selling drugs. They thinking they hard and tough. And then what happened? Somebody out the crew is always portraying that they something they not. And as soon as them cops get in their face, they go to folding, right? Well, this karma came in the way of one of the people in the crew his conscience, it kept eating at him. He couldn't, I can imagine, bro, imagine doing that to someone and having to lay down every night, bro. It's on your mind. No matter how, you could try drinking, you could try, dr it no matter how, bro, it's gonna eat at you. You know what I mean? Especially if you have somewhat decency left in your body, oh, it's gonna eat at you. 
Straight up. Number four. Twelve-year-old Michelle Welch was living in Tacoma, Washington when she mysteriously vanished on March 26, 1986. Michelle had gone to a park a few blocks from her home with two of her younger sisters. The siblings arrived at the park at 10 a.m. and spent an hour playing and exploring. Around 11 a.m., Michelle rode her bike back home, leaving her sisters at the park to pack lunches. When she returned to the park, she chained her bike beside her sisters, sat their lunch on a table nearby, and went searching for her siblings. The two younger girls had walked to a nearby business to use the bathroom, but Michelle was obviously unaware of that at the time, and spent time searching the park in nearby forest areas for the sisters. The younger girls arrived back at the park about two hours later and found their packed lunches sitting on the table. However, they couldn't locate Michelle. The girls searched for a short time and eventually returned to their day of play. Eventually, the girls searched a bit more before they were told to come back home by their babysitter. After the girls returned home and explained what happened to Michelle, the babysitter realized something was very wrong and called the girls' parents as well as local authorities. Around 3 p.m. that day, officers and family members arrived at the park to find the young girl. The search carried on tirelessly for several hours until a search dog finally located Michelle's remains at around 11.30 p.m. According to the case details available online, she was found in a makeshift fire pit area in a gulch. She'd been beaten and sexually assaulted and died from a cut to her neck. During Bro, get this fool face off the screen right now, fam. Right now. Cause like <sighs> kids, bro, our kids are supposed to be able to go to the park and play and not have to worry about this type of stuff. Right? But now it's like you gotta keep your kids so sheltered that they can't even get outside. I know you hear people saying, oh, it's the video games that's keeping the kids inside nowadays. It's not just that. It's sickos like this that's on the screen right now. They keeping the kids inside. Why? Because you don't know what'll happen if you let your kid go off the porch. It used to be a running joke back in the day. Uh, moms won't let you off the porch. Now it's like, stay on the porch. Stay on the porch. During the following investigation, a classmate came forward to report that they'd seen a man walking toward the area where Michelle was found. Unfortunately, this witness lacked crucial details to accurately describe the unknown man and a suspect was never apprehended. A few months after Michelle's death, Tacoma police were informed of a similar murder. Jennifer Bastian was close to Michelle in age and circumstances of her death were eerily similar, leading investigators to believe that this could have been the work of a serial killer, or at least a registered sex offender with a lengthy criminal past. However, it was revealed in 2015 after new testing that the- I knew it. I was about to say, man, get him- I know I said get him off the screen. I felt like they left it there just to e piss me off even more, bro same person did not commit both crimes. Despite over 10,000 hours of investigative work being poured into the case in 1986, it was eventually set aside and went cold. In 2016, investigators submitted the found DNA to a database, which would predict the physical description of the suspect. After a general- So they said since 86 to 2016, bro? Jeez. Glad they didn't give up on it, though. Eventually set aside and went cold. In 2016, investigators submitted the found DNA to a database, which would predict the physical description of the suspect. After a general description was provided, the Tacoma Police Department activated its child abduction response team and treated the case as if it were brand new. While this was great news for the case, the major breakthrough didn't occur until early 2018. Officers submitted the DNA sample for genealogy testing and those results combined with the physical description of the suspect helped investigators create a family tree which led them directly to a suspect. They tracked down Gary Hartman and followed him into a restaurant one day. Officers collected DNA off of a used napkin that he left behind, and the results showed that Gary's DNA matched the samples from the scene of the crime. Oddly enough, Gary had a clean criminal record and was working as a nurse at a local hospital. The 66-year-old suspect was charged for so he had access to more kids working as a nurse. Think about that next time you roll up in the hospital, you let your guard down. You know what I mean? Or, or you sitting there, you sleeping in the hospital and the nurse, you know how you in there sleeping? Hospital bed, the nurses come in and out all night, but half the time you be sleep so you don't see who comes in and out your room all night. 
Like, it's it's becoming more apparent. It's becoming more apparent, man. It's nowhere safe to let your guard down. Anywhere. Sicko. For murder and rape. Number three. April Tinsley was an eight-year-old girl from Fort Wayne, Indiana, that was abducted in 1988. April was outside playing with friends before she went missing on April 1st, 1988. The children were moving between houses and playing in the streets of their quiet suburban neighborhood like it was any other day. Many of the children had returned home, but April had forgotten her umbrella at a friend's house. According to the friend's mother, April grabbed her umbrella and left, heading in the direction of her home. However, she was never seen again. April's mother was concerned when her daughter didn't return home for dinner that night and searched briefly throughout the neighborhood but eventually decided to call police. Although her call occurred in the late evening, investigators concluded that the child disappeared at around 3 p.m. earlier that day. A massive search party of over 300 officers and countless residents of the neighborhood looked- That's a lot of time. That's a lot of time that she's been missing, bro, for them to- That gave somebody, whoever took her, like a, a huge head start everywhere for April. The search continued until a jogger found April's remains on April 4th. She was found in a ditch along the road around 30 minutes from her hometown. One of her shoes and an erotic toy in a plastic bag was found nearby her body. An autopsy report showed that April was assaulted and strangled. It was provided that she'd been deceased for at least one or two days before she was discovered. The following investigation caused several witnesses to call in and report information. One witness claimed that they saw a white man in his 30s forcing April into the back of his pickup truck one day when she disappeared. Another report described a similar male in a blue pickup truck near the site where April's remains were found. Despite these details, officers were unable to locate the suspect or any further evidence that could have helped the case. At first, it was believed that April's case was connected to a similar case of a child that was murdered in the same state. The circumstances of the crimes were similar but not exactly the same. After an in-depth analysis, it was determined that the two cases were unrelated and investigators once again hit a dead end. In 1990, a message was written across a barn door in Crayon. The message read, I kill 8-year-old April M. Tinsley. Did you find the other shoe? Ha ha, I will kill again. Although evidence and DNA samples were collected from this scene, it didn't help lead officers to a suspect. In 2004, decades after the case had gone cold, the killer left taunting letters for investigators. The notes mentioned the case, featured photos of the killer from the waist down, and used condoms. The notes were left on the front doors of homes where young girls lived. The DNA from the condoms matched the DNA collected from the scene, but investigators were still unable to locate a suspect. In 2015, popular new technology was used to create a physical description of the suspect, and in January of 2018, a new law required criminals convicted of felony charges to submit DNA samples to be entered into a nationwide database. The database found a match for April's case and led officers to their suspect. Cops arrived at John Miller's home, and when asked if he knew why they were there, he responded, April Tinsley. He wanted to get caught. Like, that's a different level of a sicko, bro. To go around and just be putting notes, laughing, taunting, taunting them. That's a different level sicko, man. He wanted to get caught. And there's criminals, there's more criminals out there just like him that w do stuff and get upset when the police don't catch him. I'm telling you, man. Just gotta shake your head. Number two. Instead of focusing on a single victim, this cold case breakthrough is about a killer with many victims. Additionally, this case is different because it doesn't rely on new technology being used on old DNA samples. Instead, this breakthrough is the result of Samuel Little coming forward to confess his heinous crimes. In 1984, Little met 21-year-old Mary Jo Payton at a bar. They talked for some time and eventually left the bar together. Little drove Mary to an abandoned factory where he then strangled her. He disposed of her remains in a basement stairwell and she was later found by employees of a nearby company. In August of 1991, Little met 32-year-old Rose Evans whom he later strangled in his car and dumped in a vacant lot. Rose was discovered by a pedestrian. Both cases were investigated but officers failed to discover any substantial evidence that would help them identify a killer. As a result, the cases eventually went cold and stayed that way for decades. 
In 2012, Little was arrested for narcotics charges. While imprisoned, Little was required by Los Angeles police to provide a DNA sample for his suspected involvement in unsolved murder cases. The samples were a match, and Little was convicted of three murder charges, for which he was handed three life sentences. Little confessed to murdering up to 93 women as part of a plea deal, and investigators and prosecutors immediately went to work to confirm Little's connection to the endless... 93 women. 93 women. Like, those are football jersey numbers. Are you kidding me? 93 what life life without parole is not a big enough sentence for me that's not enough and i'm pretty sure those 93 women would feel the same i know they their families do life ain't enough i told y'all i go back and forth with the death penalty bro but hearing stories like these 93 women Stu had no soul. He had no heart, no remorse for nothing he did. 90. I got to keep saying that number, fam. 93. Y'all think years is gone? Nah, it's not enough. Series of crimes. Little sat down with the team and explained the details and locations of every murder that he could remember. He also provided 16 sketches of victims to help officers locate possible unsolved missing persons or murder cases. The sketches were released to the public as a call for action for anyone who may have information. Although more than half of Little's crimes are successfully confirmed in connection to it, officers are still trying to confirm others. Seeing as most of these charges will ultimately result in the 78-year-old killer spending the rest of his life behind bars, it's almost strange that he confessed to all of these crimes. Some speculate that the guilt finally caught up with him. Others think that someone who was able to kill 93 people probably just doesn't feel any remorse. Exactly. But regardless of his motive, his confessions have led to justice being served and the victim's loved ones finally getting answers to questions that haunted them for decades. It's still not enough. Period. Number one. The most disturbing murder cases are the ones in which the victim was just living their daily life completely unaware of their fate. In 1998, 18-year-old Miranda Fenner was blissfully unaware that she would be killed while working an evening shift at a video rental store in her hometown. Around 8.15 p.m. during her shift, a passing motorist noticed a young woman trying to crawl out of the video store. The witness approached the victim, who was later confirmed to be Miranda, and noticed blood spilling out. The witness called 911, and emergency responders arrived within minutes. Miranda had been stabbed multiple times in her neck and head, and was rushed to a hospital. She was treated for her wounds, but ultimately did not survive. She passed away about two hours later. The investigation was on, and officers focused on obtaining as much information as possible. 700 interviews were conducted over the course of the investigation, but the efforts proved to be useless as investigators continuously hit dead ends. A small amount of cash had been stolen from the video store, which suggested that the crime was a robbery gone raw. However, other details combined with Miranda's wounds proved that the murder was more than just about a few dollars in cash. As you may expect, the case was pushed aside and went cold. Over the following years, efforts were made to reopen the case, and DNA samples were submitted by a variety of databases and testing centers, but to no avail. Finally, though, in 2017, 19 years after the crime, a suspect was apprehended. Zachary David O'Neill was being interrogated by- I hate hearing how many years went by without the case being solved, because I automatically think this person actually got to live out their life. They got to live the rest of their lives, their lives. So when by the time you catch them, they're like, Shh, I don't live my life. Like that pisses me off royally. Sorry, y'all, but it does. I hate hearing that number. It's in testing centers, but to no avail. Finally, though, in 2017, 19 years after the crime, a suspect was apprehended. Zachary David O'Neill was being interrogated by Yellowstone County Sheriff's Office for rape and attempted murder. After hours of interviewing, O'Neill finally confessed to the crime. Additionally, he confessed that he was the killer in Miranda's case, though. His statement provided specific details that proved that this was true. DNA samples were also compared and confirmed that he was a match. Much to the surprise of investigators and family members, O'Neill explained that he was attempting to rob the video store when Miranda put up a fight, which led to him killing her. This is yet another case in which the case was solely solved based on the criminal confession. 
Obviously, Miranda's loved ones were happy to see her killer finally facing justice. Why you want to make it seem like he had to do it because of robbery? No, fam. No, a robbery charge, you'd have had more likely a chance to come home in a few years. No, you wanted to kill her. It ain't like that. You see robberies all the time where somebody show up and then they run out of there. No, no, no. You wanted to do that or you had been thinking about killing or you wasn't afraid to kill, period. Don't sit there and act like it was, oh, she just popped up. So I had to. No, out of here. Nobody believe in that. You ain't even believe in that. It's fine. Piss me off. All right, man. You know what I mean? These, uh, these stories, bro. But you got to hear them. You got to sit through them. You got to listen to them. You got to, man, because you got to know what's out there. Avoiding these type of things, avoiding listening, avoiding hearing this is is ultimately putting you at a disadvantage, fam. You got to keep yourself on guard and on high alert. Seriously, when you start getting complacent and sitting sitting around and acting like it can't happen to you, it's when it happens. I know y'all heard the story. Well, some of y'all haven't heard the story, but um, a guy that I watched, a battle rapper, also he's on Wild and Out with Nick Cannon, Hitman Holla. He does the wild style battles a lot. This girl was at home while he was out of town. He was on FaceTime with her. Somebody broke in the house, shot through her cheek, and it came out the back of her head. He was on FaceTime with her trying to coach her on how to survive the situation. Can you imagine? That's what I'm saying, man. It's getting ruthless out here. Protect yourselves. All right? Protect yourselves. It's your boy L, man. Y'all get at me in the comment section. Let me know what y'all thought. And uh, stick around and stay tuned, man. Until the next reaction, I'm out. Peace, y'all. Stay solid. Hey.